west coast of Canada's Vancouver Island is chock full of beauty anywhere you look. Since I joined the show five years ago, everyone has told me Desolation Sound is the ultimate in beauty cruising destinations. So here we are. And by we, I mean me and my father-in-law, Brian Armitage. The man who introduced my wife to boating as a baby and who was integral in getting me into the cruising life. Finally, I had a chance to repay him for years of trips and tips and to take him somewhere he hadn't boated. And trust me, that is a short list. This is gonna be our floating home away from home for the week, a 2005 Meridian 341 one of a dozen powerboats in the fleet of Desolation Sound yacht charters, based right here in Comox Harbor in, you guessed it, Comox, British Columbia. Doesn't matter if you have 45 years experience all over North American waters, like Brian, host a boating TV show, like me, or have only boated on your home lake. Everyone who captains a vessel here gets the same chart walkthrough and intro video as an ocean master sailor guides you through the hotspots. That way, nothing is accidentally forgotten. Next, you get a detailed walkthrough in person this time of your vessel. Doesn't matter how many boats I've been on, they're all a little different, and you definitely want to know everything. Again, they've made it as foolproof as possible. The 341, named Skyrider, has an overall length of 36 feet with Cummins 250 horsepower diesel engines and older but excellent equipment. But there's no conditions where you guys will not be able to pass the bar uh, on this boat for sure, um, no matter what the weather throws at you. It can get a little choppy out here, but there's, uh, there's no reason why you wouldn't attempt it. Chart run through and boat walk through complete. We call it a night. Reviewing the charts again, ready to head out bright and early. There's something so cool about being out on a boat and seeing snow-capped peaks and glaciers. And don't get me wrong, you can do this in the winter out here, but it is hot. It's like 30 degrees, 100 for my American friend. The semi-displacement hull of the Meridian, paired with its power, means it's not getting up on plane. In fact, the top speed we hit was around 12 knots. Though, had we gone with the tidal current and had less gear on board, we surely could have eked out a bit more. Still, cruising here is best done slow and easy, soaking up the sights. There's a reason, after all, that trawlers dominate the boating world up here. You ever boated in BC? Never been to BC. Being able to share this experience is amazing as is, but to know this is my father-in-law's first ever time in British Columbia, that's a bonus. And when you get two boat lovers alone, there's a lot of this. But this is a nice boat, though, right? So this is kind of like a, uh, what you call a tug, only it's a, set up as a catch. You see the difference? It's a motor sail or catch, right? Yeah, look at that. Funky. Nice boat. So lots of space out here and obviously lots of water. I and mean, it looks like lots of depth, too, but it's not. All of that is trouble. So you got to find this, the P50 marker, Cut around that, follow it out to the next one right there. That'll get you safely across Comox Bar. And there we are. It's a big old thing, but if it's really choppy, that would be hard to see. From here, it's about a 14 nautical mile run across the Strait of Georgia, which separates Vancouver Island from the mainland. And depending on the winds, it can get pretty rough, but it's usually decent in the summer. We had a few rollers to contend with, but nothing the 341 or we couldn't handle. See, there may just be two of us, but we got all our bases covered. We're looking out. I got the Garmin GPS going. I got the Navionics rocking on my phone. And I got an old Salty with binoculars here. How's she looking? Steady the course. Before heading north, we took a detour around the east side of Vivian Island to check out Maz's first recommendation. Little outcropping of islands are Sea Lion Central. And he wasn't kidding. It was full-on National Geographic over here. But trust me, stay upwind of these puppies. The smell is intense. Later in the show, we'll continue north and hit our first anchorage, just not as fast as this fella.
back in beautiful British Columbia. And we're right around the midway point of Vancouver Island in Desolation Sound. It's far enough up the mainland that you're north of the Sunshine Coast Highway. There are a few small roads and a ferry to Cortez Island, but the vast majority of this region is unviewable and definitely unreachable by anything but boat or float plane. And just north of Sea Lion Central is the mustache-shaped Savory Island. It's 7.5 kilometers long, but only one kilometer wide. It has a number of homes on it and some B&Bs as well, but they're all off the grid as the island has no power. The north side does have a sandy beach though, which is very popular with boaters looking for a relaxing day on the hook. But no time for us to swim, we're heading north. Like many areas, you got a variety of route options, but the most popular has to be going through the Tulin Passage, which runs between the Copeland Islands Marine Provincial Park and the mainland. This archipelago is sometimes considered the northern Gulf Islands, but more accurately, they are the Discovery Islands. And on the east side of Cortez, one of the larger islands up here, you'll find the popular anchorage of Squirrel Cove. So our depth has dropped from 140 meters to 21 and dropping. Yeah, there's rocks there. And we're coming into Squirrel Cove through this narrow passage here. And as you can see, popular place to be. How are we looking up there? All good? Beauty. Sweet mother of real estate. Even though at its longest point, it's almost one and a half kilometers long, it feels snug and tucked away. And it can get busy in the height of July and August. So what do you think? Should we go back further here or should we go back in there? Or if you want to come around here, we can do the go to shore. Well, let's try that. Because of significant tides, as much as 18 feet or five and a half meters, a common way to anchor here is to tie a stern line around a tree to prevent your boat from swinging around. If I'm not back in three minutes, tell the world my story. Flip-flops is not the appropriate footwear. The key here is to find a living tree above the high water mark, and then the best practice is not to tie one end to the boat, run it out, and run it back. That means lines in the water when you're running the dinghy and all kinds of nonsense. It's actually easier to take the whole line, wrap the middle around the tree, and then feed both sides out slowly as you come back to the boat. Then you're snug and secure for the night. Maz outfitted us with a crab pot, as Dungeness crab are found all over these parts. So Brian and I loaded in the dinghy and headed out to find a good spot. Deep enough that the seals wouldn't try to get the bait. And then we let it soak overnight. Good morning. Bright and early, nice and sunny. We got the dinghy secured, engines are running, we're still anchored, but the beauty of this system is we don't have to go out there and walk the whole line. So Brian, if you just undo your side, in theory, I'll be able to pull it around. That is a good system. So now, we got Brian up at the bow, we're gonna bring the anchor up, but something that people often try and do is use their windlass to pull the boat forward and lift it up. Your windlass isn't designed for that. It's really only designed to lift it straight up. So Brian's gonna lift it up, and when it looks like it's starting to get a little bit of an angle, just before it starts pulling, I'm gonna kick it forward. Let's go check our crab pot. And we got back out, we discovered our crab pot was gone. We thought the tidal current had taken it, but it was quite heavy, and none of the other traps around here had drifted away. The locals told us later that traps get stolen on the regular. A sad fact, so if you do this, keep it within line of sight and don't do the overnight soak that we tried. So back to Refuge Cove. This co-op of land has 18 shareholders who live here and the businesses are all owned and operated by co-op members. This truly is buying local. Hey Steve, are you there? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, let's go see if we can buy a crab pot. Sold. Free telephones. This place has everything. Jokes aside, this place does have pretty much everything you need. 
from wine to bait to, thankfully, crab pots. There's also fuel and a garbage drop for a fee. And you can tie up here for the night if you want some land lubber time. But we've got so much more to see. This week, we are back in British Columbia to continue our cruise in Desolation Sound, located between the mainland and Vancouver Island. The island was named after Captain George Vancouver, and he himself named Desolation Sound in 1792 because it was, well, desolate, gloomy and barren in his eyes. He wasn't looking to get away from it all like boaters these days who head up to this neck of the woods. And to this day, it remains a place to enjoy unspoiled natural beauty. And if that's desolate, so be it. The whole region is popular with people cruising up from Vancouver, Victoria, and Seattle. Or like us, renting a charter boat from Desolation Sound Yacht Charters and beginning our journey from Comox, BC. Us being my father-in-law and me. Brian was integral into getting me into boating, and I finally had the opportunity to take him somewhere he'd never been. And this marks 10 years since his kidney transplant, so this was also a celebration cruise. P.S. Be an organ donor. Fittingly, there's no shortage of stunning scenery. We weren't fortunate enough to see whales, but it's not uncommon around these parts. Bald eagles, though? Tons of them. And a whole whack of wild trawlers. Slow and steady cruising is the way to get around up here. A must-see spot is the Teakern Falls at the northeast corner of Teakern Arm. This small section is actually a provincial park. Hard to access, but that means it's protected. But you might have to wait your turn to get up close and personal with it. That's rocking along pretty good, eh? It is, coming from the top of a mountain. <laughs> I don't know what the speed of that would be, but it is coming over those rocks fast. I like how it falls out. We could almost put the bow under there, I think. Made of the mist? <laughs> <laughs> that is spectacular. How cold do you think that is? I don't know, but it would go good with your scotch. <laughs> That's fresh glacier water. Heading south and east around the southern tip of West Redonda Island, we chose to squeeze between it and the Martin Islands. It looks wide enough, but the GPS shows the deep passage is actually quite narrow. One of the frustrations when filming somewhere as magnificent as British Columbia is that photos and videos never truly do justice to such massive and awe-inspiring landscapes. This, for example, right here is East Redonda Island. And yeah, it looks pretty big on your TV. In real life, though, it is just dominating. The highest point right there is actually 1.6 kilometers high or 5,220 feet. That's a big old island. Right now, we are smack dab in the middle of the Waddington Channel, which separates East Redonda Island from its sister to the west, surprise, surprise, West Redonda Island. Now, these names date all the way back to 1792, when Spanish explorers Valdez and Galeano first sighted them and gave them the name Isla Redonda, which means round island think it would be a little more creative, and yet, in Spanish, it sounds fantastico. We're doing a detour north to Pendrel Sound for a very particular reason. Yes, it's just as beautiful as the rest, and just as private as much of this region we've cruised through. The few boats we've seen being swallowed up by the monstrous surroundings. So Pendrel Sound is a unique geographic anomaly for being where we are in Canada. There's snow-covered peaks all around us. This is either, depending who you ask, the warmest saltwater in the Northern Hemisphere, the warmest saltwater north of Mexico, or the second warmest in the Northern Hemisphere. Whatever it is, the consensus is, this is super warm. So, in the name of science, oh, well that's not, hot tub warm, but that is definitely pool warm. And when you look up and see snow on a mountain peak, that's impressive. This is the perfect swimming spot. But to preserve our ratings, I will not strip down and jump in on camera anyway. Uh, hey, look, a mountain. Cannonball! Ooh. 
When we return to Desolation Sound later in the show, we'll check out one of the most popular and picturesque anchorages. And we hit up a small but very busy harbor. Welcome back to beautiful British Columbia and on board a Meridian 341 from Desolation Sound Yacht Charters. We've made it to Desolation Sound Provincial Park, which was founded nearly 200 years after Captain George Vancouver gave the sound its name. The park's been protected since 1973. And there are more than 60 kilometers of shoreline, including multiple islands. This right here, Prito Haven, is one of the three major anchorages within the park. And it can be packed in the high season. So taking the stern tie game up a notch, there are chains in the rocks along the northern shore, and you can use them so you don't swing around, and they help fit in more boats. We're in 13 meters, so we're in 40 feet. Tide's gonna go up 10 feet, and we have the chain directly behind us. So pull forward a little bit, drop it, do the backup thing. I think so. Sharp shells on the rock make securing the stern chains at low tide a bit tricky, but it's nothing you can't tackle. The links are even big enough to fit a large line through. And when you're secured, you're in a postcard picture-worthy location. Protected, calm, and quiet, but with mountains and trees. Next day, the winds had kicked up for our 15 nautical mile run around Sarah Point and down toward Lund through the Tulin Passage, named after the Swedish brothers who founded the town of Lund back in the 1800s. Lund Harbor is a funky little fishing village with about 300 permanent residents, maybe. And it's a popular spot for boaters, but they don't do advanced reservations, so you need to radio in for a slip assignment. And the harbor master will not assign a slip until you're within line of sight so this is a true last-minute call-in. Uh, Hi there, uh, we're looking to come in and uh, tie up for the night. I uh, was wondering where we should go. Alrighty, I'm gonna bring you in on the south side of A Dock, south side of Alpha. It would be a bow and port tie or stern and starboard if you prefer. Perfect, easy. Though so small and without reservations, Harbormaster Darlene told me she has not turned a boat away yet, but every vessel in here has to be willing to raft off, as that's the norm on busy days. It's officially fishing focused, but there's always room for recreational boats. Lund is a great spot because you can resupply everything from fuel to food and beer to baked goods. But of course, you gotta pay the piper first. Oh, forecast. Ooh, strong wind warning. It is breezy. Be a little bumpy tomorrow. I would think it's going to be a big bumpy, going to 25 knots. But that's a tomorrow problem. Right now, our mission is to see if the repeated recommendations from fellow boaters live up to the hype. Without fail, when we mentioned Lund, we were told to come right here. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. We've heard all about the cinnamon buns, so we're going to do a sampler platter. Four, pick two. Pecan, old chocolate orange. I could say something about my recommendation being linked to supporting local businesses, which I love to do, but that's secondary to even the smell of this place alone. Awesome. Thanks, Thank man. Thank you very much. Great the other must-do recommendation we got was to leave the harbor in this Martin's Taxi, a 1947 Hudson that was actually a cab back in the day down in Philadelphia, and now it's here of all places. Really right, good thanks. to meet you. Yeah, no. Beautiful car. This is my phone on Brian. Brian, my nice to meet you. He's going to be very excited about the car. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I'm an old car guy. Is that Mechanic right? and yeah. everything. Okay. We can fix it if it breaks down. Oh, well, you may, may be called on. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great restaurant on the other side of the peninsula. It's about a 12-minute ride. That's $50 round trip, but totally worth it. Not just to cruise in a classic car like this, 
but because every penny of that $50 goes to the SPCA, because Martin volunteers his time and his car to raise money. Brian has taught me as much about cooking as he has about boating, and we usually whip up a feast on the boat. But as the sun was setting over Desolation Sound on our final night, we treated ourselves to some of the best seafood we've ever had anywhere with the best backdrop around. Our big journey ended with a 25 nautical mile run from the dock at Lund to the fuel dock at Comox Municipal Marina. And clearly, British Columbia was as sad to say goodbye as we were to leave.